Hi, welcome to I Shoot Watches. My name is Dayton. Today I'm going to go over this watch, the GG, from a patent and kind of industrial point of view. This is the latest revision of the PDF that I made. And um, there's a lot of additional information in the PDF, but I wanted to try to do a short video where I focus on the points that I find the most um, uh, interesting about it. And so the, the watch... Uh, there's a playlist linked in the description, and also uh, I'll make it pop up if you're watching this on a computer. Um, so if you want longer form depth of this, you can go to any of those. Uh, I think even if you don't know anything about this watch, you'll be able to infer a lot from this discussion. But I'm not going to go into lengthy descriptions of everything. So I bought this watch um, used uh, a couple months ago, three months ago now, and um, it, it looks like a swatch, but it had an Omega reference number in it from the mid-1960s and had a movement in it. This is the watch that that reference number corresponds to, the actual Omega. And this is the watch I found with the proper dial and uh, hands from the reference number in it. So <clears throat> my theory is that it's a it's a actually an Omega prototype and that it was the swatch design was basically taken from this Omega prototype and the evidence behind that lies mostly in the patent record and then some kind of assumptions about um, industrial processes and kind of design uh, evolution so the official story behind the swatch is that it was basically designed by four people. Um, uh, Elmar Mock and Jacques Muller were the ETA, the, the movement company engineers that designed the movement. And they were focused on plastic and making a watch movement work with a minimal number of uh, parts in a plastic monocoque single body case where the where Normally, you would have a movement that would come out of a watch in, a, in like a classic mechanical metal watch or even a quartz watch. They wanted to reduce the number of parts by making it actually embedded in the plastic case. So the case has, the, the, the case becomes the plastic main plate for the watch. So, so th th it, was, it was Elmar Mock and, and um, Jacques Muller and also uh, Jacques Muller's brother, Bernard Muller, and his partner, Marley Schmidt. And... Uh, Schmidt and Muller um, gave the watch its kind of um, visual flair. The, the, the co so the concept of, by the time they got involved, the concept of the swatch was already kind of developed enough to, to they, they knew that they wanted to make it trendy and fun and, and, and fashion oriented and have colors and patterns and designs. So, but th there was some in the early 80s, 1981, 82, they, they, the, the, the official narrative is that they played around with different designs and they arrived at um, this design that um, ends up looking like this with these, the main features of the design being these two extra lug supports and then the, the shroud over the lug, which is the, the fact that the lugs are hidden by the, by the material here. And of course this, um, this watch has those same features. So <clears throat> the watch came with a, a, a Omega Movement Cal 601, and it was designed, the, the, the gold watch here I'm talking about, it came with this Cal 601 movement, which was manufactured from 1962 to 1970 by Omega. Um, that was the movement inside of it, and the caliber on it, like describing that movement, uh, or the cutout for it is from that same movement from that 1966 uh, Seamaster Cosmic watch, this watch. So the movement was, this is the movement that was in the watch and this movement had a, a serial number on it, which, which um, I, I visited Omega and I talked to their um, heritage people and Swatch Heritage about uh, the details of this. And this serial number is in their archives as being a spare part serial number. So this movement, and it, and it was put into service in March 1970, at the very end of this movement's um, manufacturing lifespan, which again was from 62 to 70. And, the, and normally, if it, if it had gone into a prototype at that time, it would have been, 
they would have changed this bridge, which has the serial number on it, and they would have changed that to a serial number that is a special serial number for prototypes. And the re reason they did that was to keep track of prototypes. So they have a stack of bridges for every movement sitting around with these prototype numbers on them. Um, oh, that's what they told me. So it doesn't have a prototype bridge on it, but it has a spare part bridge, the movement. And the other thing that the movement tells us is not a swatch. Um, everybody agrees that swatch would never, swatch, it, it's policy for them never to put an Omega movement in a swatch. And, the, and everybody that has been involved uh, in this conversation, including Jean-Claude Egan, who's the CEO of La Joux Perret, who I was introduced to, and he, he commented on it in an email. Um, every, he also said that it would never be, they would never put an Omega movement in a swatch. Um, and that's because ETA, the, the company that made the swatch originally, is a movement company. They, if they needed a movement, they have their own movements. Um, and and uh, not only that, but just policy within the parent company was such that that would never happen. So anyway, in 1982, the first swatch that was released looked like this, and it has these shrouded lugs and this um, these two support bridges. And then 10 years later, this watch, I, I just chose it because it's such a visual, visually identical uh, to the to the GG. I just wanted to show. If you look at the details of the buckle, and the, and because this is a platinum watch, it has the same shine. It has a clear um, case back, so it, it's different in that respect. But if you just look at those two designs, they basically look the same. They're not the same, actually, though, in terms of minor details. Um, but the but they but they're visually the same enough so that one would say that that is the same design. Um, so my belief is that this. The, the watch that I found was a prototype either for the movement that the reference number inside it, I mean, for uh, for the, the this watch, the, the one shown in black and white here and in color over here in its advertising. My belief is that it was an abandoned prototype either for this, because this is the reference number it has inside it, which would date it to around 1965 or 66. And I'll get into why it may have been abandoned. Um, or it was a, a prototype at the end of the run of this for its successor. So in that case, the successor watch would have, they would have used the old reference number because they didn't have the new reference number yet. And the reason I think it might've been a prototype for this is because of its visual similarity to this, pro, to this um, successor, the Cosmic 2000, which was four years later or s six years later in 1972. And of course, these are not identical, but they you can see the, the similar form. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that, that I've um, started to, and to some extent, um, made connections between the artifact and dates. But, but um, because I'm going to focus on the patent, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail over that. You can download this PDF if, you're, if you want to go into the details. Um, there is a, there is something I'm very interested in though, which also gets into the IP, which is the initials GG. When I first saw the watch, even before I bought it, I thought that what would be interesting about it is if these represent Gerald Genta and Gerald Genta is a, a famous watch designer who designed, um, t tens of thousands, if not hundreds, hundred thousand different watch designs over the course of his long career. And many of them are uncredited, but because he designed some super famous watches, um, like the Aubemar Piguet Royal Oak and the uh, Patek Philippe Nautilus, not just because of that, but those watches are very famous, and they made they 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 made him even more famous as a designer. So I thought it'd be interesting if 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 I could prove that those are his initials. Um, so there's a stamp on it that's a crab stamp on the watch case and on the buckle, and this page is about how that could be referring to the fact that it's a monocoque, monohull case. Um, and then this is about the watch when it was released, the promotion for it, and the fact that it was, it was designed to, to fit into this um, Omega's relationship with NASA. That's why it's called Cosmic. And I think that the smooth form of it, um, which was unusual for the period, 
may reflect that kind of um, space age design aesthetic because it, it is unusual for the 1960s, that kind of form. Um, this is a page about how the, the, the swatch, modern swatch straps don't fit in the free ring, which holds the, the strap in place, but it would have, a, a, a lizard strap from the 1960s probably would fit through there, and that's probably what it was designed for. Um, there's some interesting things about the stamps and, and uh, kind of forensically linking them, figuring out what was stamped by what, and if there may be an opportunity in the future to compare these stamps. Basically, like, they have a fingerprint because of chips and details in the, uh, the punches themselves that could eventually be used to date it to other kind of contemporaneous artifacts. Um, this page is about some clues from those things. Uh, Hallmark, there is a, for the patents, it doesn't really matter, but the, there's a gold, a, a tradition, not even a tr tradition, but like a industry standard in Switzerland, which is if you, you, you when you sell gold jewelry, you stamp it with a a stamp, or the Bureau of Control does. They've certified that it's the it's the um, gold purity that's stated on it. So this lacks that. It was never stamped by a um, purity by the by the Bureau of Control, and because it lacks that, I tested it, and it is 18 karat gold. The watch case and buckle, um, and then these screw bars are actually 24 uh, 22 karat or higher, probably 22 24 karat gold. The bars that hold the bracelet on. Um, the reason that the, I believe that the reason the watch was designed with these extra lugs is to support these soft 24 karat gold screw bars and a metal bracelet. The, the movement or the, the cases, uh, um, reference number includes SP at the end. And from what I've read, that indicates that was that case that I, the case I have was, was designated for a strap, but Omega during that period, um, made usually made cases so that they could be paired with a strap or a bracelet, like a metal bracelet. So the fact that they specified that this particular one was for a strap could indicate that there were, uh, was also a bracelet in mind. And when the bracelet is, the bracelet version would be the same. It would just be uh, retailed with a bracelet on it. Um, so I think that there would have been a bracelet designed for this. Uh, and the, the hinge aspect of it is starting to approach what uh, Genta became famous for with the Royal Oak and the Nautilus, which is integrated uh, bracelet. So um, Genta was working, and now we're going to start to get into the IP. Genta was working on contract exclusively for Omega from 1960 to 65. Um, and in 1964, uh, the head of creative of Omega, Pierre Monat, patented the first integrated bracelet design patent. It's the only patent I could find that Pierre Moynat ever filed, even though he was the head of creative for Omega from 1955 to 1981. And because he filed it in 64 and it granted in 65, that was during the time that Genta was on contract to work exclusively with Omega. And it means that, that Genta would have been involved in, in that invention and he, he could have been completely responsible for it the way that the industry worked. Even though it has Pierre Monat's name on it, it the way that contracts were done, uh, it could be that that is Genta's invention. And I'll show you an example of that in, a, in another patent. But I'm not saying it is or it's not. They work together, um, and the Omega produced a patent or, or patented uh, a design. And this particular design... In one of the claims has in it a, a dependent claim, which is specifying two screw bars that screw together into the outer lugs. And that's exactly what the gold watch has. It's a split screw bar threaded from both sides. And that's, at that time, it was highly unusual if it's from that time, it, and and I assume it is, but um, enough so that it, there, I think that there's a relationship there. Um, and then the this is more about swatch details around the screw bar and how the swatch doesn't use a screw bar at all. It uses a bar that's pushed in and kind of just um, resistance holds it in. Uh, and that reduces the number of parts. Like a spring bar, which is a normal watch, would have um, 
two end pieces of spring plus a tube, so four pieces. And the swatch was all about trying to reduce the piece count. So this reduced four pieces to one, or just getting rid of split screw, screw bars that reduced two pieces to one. And that was a, a kind of aim of swatch design overall. It also makes the assembly easier. And then this is back to like a, a tiny detail on the uh, swatch that was also in the, the, the GG, the gold watch, and kind of how it was phased out over time a decade after the first swatches came out. Um, this is a this this page is about the 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 diameter. This is a, the first prototype for the swatch, or not the first, the second. It's called the Zog prototype in 1981, and they 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 coincidentally chose a diameter for the crystal on this of 32.95 millimeter, which is exactly the diameter of the crystal in the in the uh, the gold watch. Um, the gold watch uses Omega's tool 107 which is marked 1073295 because you put a 32.95 uh, millimeter crystal in it and it compresses it down into the case and then it expands to, to seal. Um, the dial and hands are, are in, there are elements of that that connect them to Ger Gerald Genta that I won't go into the details of. The dial, this is the back of the dial that, this dial, um, a, a dial that we know is from the ref the original reference. Um, and the back of this dial, you can see it had drill holes for these. It has four indices uh, as opposed to 12, and just it's at 12, 3, 6, and 9. And here on the back of it, you can see the holes for, for it. And I've looked at uh, pictures of a number of these. And for some reason, three of the indices have two holes, and one has three holes. And the three holes are not uniformly spaced because they were never meant to be seen. But what we noticed on the GG's dial is that there's some odd placement of the these gold dots that doesn't look very professional. But part of the reason is because they were trying to conform to these holes in an existing dial which had been overpainted. And then in the back of the GG dial, which this is an image of, you can see it has it was manufactured by Singer, the same dial manufacturer. And then you can see the tips of these gold dots that have been pressed into it. And it, when you see in detail um, the backs of those dots, you can see that the original pins were drilled out uh, and then these dots were pressed in. So you see two marks on the side where they loosened the old um, indices. And then you can see these dots were pressed in and the dots have the dots have not been burnished. Um, they are new from the factory. So in this image, it's hard to see, but they're not burnished. But the, but the production dots have been burnished down so that the back of the dial is flat. And what that's a clue is that the dots actually came from uh, pre-assemble uh, stock as opposed to being taken out of a, another dial. So there was a watch that was under development at, at Omega at the same time in 1981-82 um, that has 0.8 millimeter 9 karat gold dots. And I tested both, I tested the dots on the GG and I bought a dial like this and tested, removed and tested the dots to check that they're 9 karat and that they're 0.8 millimeter diameter, and they are. And I made a video about that. But basically this watch could have provided the dots um, for the, GG dial and it was there's there's it was also patented and the patent is how I know the date that that was finished this particular watch so this is the patent for that watch um, and that and at the same time that was that was patented May 6 1982 and you'll see that the the uh, swatch or the yeah the swatch patent was pat the, on the case design of the swatch which is coming up was patented two weeks later, but there are different companies at this point, and that's important to understand. This is at Omega, the, every, all the patents I'm talking about now. ETA was a separate company at the time, and it, two weeks later it filed for a patent on the swatch design. But um, the other patent that, I, that uh, is relevant here is that Gerald Genta was at working at Omega again in 1982. He had worked there from uh, exclusively in 61 through 65,
but he was back in 1982 on a on a contract to to uh, make this the design for the Seamaster Polaris Titanium, and that's something that's well known. And but the patent for that, I don't have to click on that actually. Anyway, the patent for that is linked in the PDF, and that was assigned to um, Fernando Fontana, who was from Lascor, the the, the case making company. And that's an example of how, even though we know Gerald Genta designed this uh, Seamaster Polaris, the patent was was uh, the inventor of the design patent um, was listed as the person who who ran the the, the case making company that, that made it. So Genta would draw the designs in in high detail, and he was the designer, but they would go to a case maker. The same thing could have happened with Pierre Monat's Omega patent. I'm not saying it did, but it's possible, and this is evidence of it. So this this Omega um, Constellation Manhattan patent is a which is on this watch. Um, this is a design patent, so there's no there's no like description or or utility to this at all. It's just drawings of the watch, and this is basically all the text of the patent, and also the the Seamaster uh, Polaris is a design patent. So it's just drawings, and uh, that will become relevant in a second. So my theory is that the that the that the dial was a dial like this was taken out of the the gold watch originally, and painted over, and these gold dots from 1981, 1982 were put in it. And the reason was to hide the fact that it was uh, coming from Omega because it was transferred to ETA, and then ETA patented, they needed a patent to protect the swatch. And because they didn't own the the rights to this case, um, they couldn't pat, they couldn't do a design patent on it, which they didn't do. But they could do uh, uh, a new use patent of the the same design um, in plastic, which they did do. So so ETA patented this the design of the gold watch, this is a drawing from their 1982 patent that was filed two weeks after the uh, Omega patent uh, before with the dots on it. Um, and it, it's a utility patent. So it focuses on the function of this arrangement of the lugs as opposed to the design of the case itself. But they drew in the, the patent attorneys drew a case back that looks like the, the gold watch. And that case back doesn't appear in the swatch in swatches for another eight years after the beginning of swatch. All the case backs before that were uh, flat and circular without this pronounced uh, beveled edge that appeared in the patent. So that that's one of the key points of the patent that I found interesting in terms of historically putting this story together. Um, this is just a page about when it was used, and here you can see what it looks like when it was finally used in a swatch eight years later and then 12 years later. Um, again, this is a page again from the that ETA case utility patent um, showing more details of that. And, and and here I talk about the fact that the fact, it, 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 it was limited, the, the patent is specifically limited to, to plastic. And as a watch company, it's true that the swatch in, was intended to be plastic, but there's no reason in, in terms of structure, like the, the gold watch was made in the same design. You could, you could claim utility for a robust design for gold just as easy as plastic, and it would still be a legitimate reason to patent it. The, my belief is that they focused on plastic because gold was, would have been barred because A, they didn't own the gold watch, so they couldn't do a, a design patent on it. And B, they, the gold watch had existed um, for, for 15 years or something, so they would risk somebody saying it wasn't a novel invention, particularly if it had ever been put on display or sold, which I don't believe it was. But I think the bigger issue now was that they, they, the ETA simply didn't own it. But you can patent some a new use for someone else's invention. Um, and I think that that's what they did, to put it simply. Um, we'll get into the business side of that shortly, so I don't want to start too much mystery with that. But basically, this page kind of goes into detail about the 
the the the, the, the design patent filed at Omega two weeks earlier versus the utility patent filed at ETA and why. Um, so what happened though is that these two companies were in the process of merging at the time. And this is just about how patents really do matter. And ETA did really need to have a patent on the swatch design and they did get the, the utility patent on the plastic limited um, utility of the design. And that is an important patent for them, and it was necessary to protect against counterfeits and, and knockoffs. And they could have, in theory, they could have transferred the IP, and I don't understand why they didn't transfer the IP. But basically what was happening was, at that time, there were these two big conglomerates in Switzerland that were both having financial hardship, and they were under, they were starting to, Nicholas Hayek, was, who became the CEO of the Swatch Group, um, was a, a consultant at the time, and he had been hired to try to um, actually, I think, liquidate the companies. And he instead he suggested merging them. And so they, he was working there for a couple of years in this time range. Uh, Swatch says from 1980. The earliest dates I can find in the literature is 1981, but definitely 81 and 82 when this development was happening. Nicholas Hayek was there, and he was focused initially on SSIH, where the Omega... Um, Omega was one of the companies in that conglomerate, and that's where the rights for this would have been. But on the other side, at ASUAG, which owned ETA, they, they were developing from, I think, as early as 1978, uh, but they were definitely in 80 and 81, they were close to finishing this design for what would become the Swatch, but they were, case, they were, they were movement designers, not case designers. So my theory is that Nicholas Hayek would have been aware as this merger started to happen of this of the the importance of the swatch and then not having a a great design for it and he would have if this if this gold watch did exist at omega he would have had the opportunity to say hey that was never used that's a great design let's let's move that over to eta but for some reason they didn't do it contractually and they opted not to not to have like a actual IP transfer and um, and then do a design patent. So they did this plastic utility patent. That's my theory. Um, and then the reason that this was all done, one of the reasons that it might've been done, even though it sounds nefarious, it isn't because the two companies did merge uh, thereafter and that was pretty much predetermined. Even if they hadn't, the, dual, the, 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 the new use of, a, of someone else's design is not uh, in itself a patent. It's, it's not, there's no pat bar on a new use. Anybody can patent a new use of someone else's invention. So there was nothing technically wrong with it. Um, and it may have been that they didn't transfer the IP because it was done in extreme secrecy and this was just an easier solution. Um, because the more people you start involving, the more you have to tell people that that's happening and it's probably a secret that Nicholas Hayek, if he's the person behind it, which he would be the person behind it, would have wanted kept secret. And it's, again, it's not because something was being done that was wrong. It's actually something that was being done that was very logical and kind of the best decision to, on a business level for all parties that could have been made at that time, as far as I'm concerned. And that's kind of what's so interesting about it to me. So um, in this slide, I just talk about how the... I do think it was an Omega prototype. Um, these are some, these uh, steel watches are Omega's contemporaneous from the same time period. These two are attributed to Gerald Genta. This one, I don't know if it is or not, um, but you can see these similarities. The gold watches, the GG in all three cases, but these steel watches are production Omegas. And it's very clear the the design aesthetic fits into that um, family of, of, of design ideas. Um, and then this is about Nicholas Hayek's motivation. So he 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 was at ETA. He was at Omega. He knew ETA was making the plastic watch. This is probably not an ETA case, but it's just a watch I happened to buy that had an ET. I like the ETA logo, and this is a. Uh, this probably would have survived in plastic too with these giant lugs, but it's not aesthetically very pleasing. So if Nicholas Hayek 
Oh, and then the, the next question was, uh, if Nicholas was aware of this, the question is, why would the why would the gold watch never have been used in the first place by Omega? And my answer to that was that the it was it was an early prototype for integrated bracelet that would have could have worked and did pro I'm sure did work with an integrated bracelet, but because of those extra lugs, it would have required a, a swatch strap essentially a, a strap exactly like the swatch. And there's an article here by Desmond Goodfoyle about um, Omega Constellation accessories in the 1960s and how important it was that like people would buy them usually with leather straps. Like the bracelet was an extra cost that most people would buy the watches with a leather strap. But if you, he doesn't say it in his article because he's not aware of this, but the, but my theory is that if you were the, the general manager of Omega at that time, you would look at the, that need for a special strap with those cutouts and you'd be like this is going to be difficult to supply all over the world and that it could be the reason why they didn't go with that design so then nicholas hayek sees it knows it hasn't been used this is in my my uh hypothesis um so he hires gerald genta to, to design the seamaster polaris which he did which you can see here and he's well known for doing that and then Nicholas Hayek, pictured in all these pictures, over the two days, two decades that he was the CEO of Omega, he he was regularly, not in every single picture, but in most pictures of him, he's seen wearing a Seamaster Polaris. And um, because the the by that time the Swatch Group owned dozens of brands and thousands of different watch designs, th there's there's there was definitely something special about the Polaris to N Nicholas Hayek. And my theory is that he hired Genta in 1982 to design the Polaris, and Genta was in on the, 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 the transfer of the design because he, of course, if he had designed it, he would have recognized it. So, so my theory is Nicholas Hayek said, I want to make you okay with this. You, I want you to not say that it's your design, but uh, I, I want to make you whole. So how, you know, if, you, if you make this watch, let, let me know what you think is fair. And... Um, that's my theory on how the watch came to be transferred to ETA. And then this page is just about the details of the patent again and why I think those are strongly indicative of the my hypothesis being right. And then some details that of the slight design differences that are significant enough that I think people that understand watch case would design would understand that this gold watch is not a copy of a swatch. It It is something different, even though it's DNA is uh, the same. It's not. It's not some copy that somebody made as a hoax or later on to as a homage or whatever. Um, and that's it. My conclusion: the reason that it was done was the importance of the swatch to the Swiss watch industry and to the to the both companies involved and their employees and customers. And it makes sense to me that they that that this story is perfectly logical and. It would have been the right thing to do if the gold watch did exist, which I believe it did. Uh, it would have been a, a very smart thing to do. Um, and then I, I purchased it for 2,700 Swiss francs um, based on these pictures. It came in this box. The original strap, unfortunately, was thrown away. I had some correspondence with the Omega dealer about that. I took it to Swatch headquarters. Um, some of the knowledge I have about it is from them. Uh, talking to me about it. And these are links to the various people I've talked to so far about it. And uh, thank you for them. And also none of them are implicated in my interpretation. My interpretation is my own. And uh, they were all just kind enough to help me with information. Um, that's it. Thanks a lot.